Hi, everybody. Welcome to Paleo After Dark's reading group. Uh, it's our first installment of our reading group. We're pretty excited to be here. Today, we're going to be going over the first two chapters of Convergent Evolution, Limited Forms Most Beautiful by George McGee. Um, and we're going to have, well, it's going to be a thing. It's going to be a good time. <laughs> it's definitely going to be a thing. Um, yeah, so I guess, do we want to get started first? I, I don't know, even, even a broader overview. Uh, Amanda, I, I kind of wanted to pose this question. Who do you think this book is written for? I think that this book is kind of an interesting combination of both scientific, it, it's for both scientific and also non-professional, I think. Um, I think it's trying to sort of, I have no idea what James is doing. This is oh. the amount of notes I made. Ah. Um, the amount of notes I made. And this is my emergency beer. Your emergency beer? Yeah, if it gets if this gets too ridiculous, I'm opening oh. and drinking my emergency beer. Uh right. Um so yeah, so I think this is trying to also be for people who are not experts in the field. But it fails. It yes, in, in some regards. It's a manifesto. I, 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 I don't. Um, I, I, I actually, because uh, this was something I was struggling with as I was reading it, because in, in the very beginning of the book, um, there's a really interesting discussion about convergent evolution, which I think is important because it's the definition for a lot of the things that uh, the author is, wants to talk about in the book. Um, and in some cases, he, he really spends a lot of time explaining very specific things to a mass audience, but other times he assumes that you know terms. So he right. explains what a synapomorphy is, like a shared derived characteristic on a tree, but doesn't explain monophyly, polyphyly, or paraphyly. And so I was, I was kind of confused at the way that it was like explaining certain things like you don't know what you're talking about, but not explaining certain other things. And, and from reading the preface um, to the entire series, because this... This is not like this is one book in a series called the Vienna series in theoretical biology, and um, when comparing to that kind of stuff, I, I really do feel like this isn't necessarily intended as uh, like a mass market or mass audience kind of science book. It's but more I, intended as like a, a theoretical thought piece. Right, but I also do think that it's not meant for people who work strictly on convergence, which maybe where I'm going wrong here. Maybe I'm just not articulating this correctly, which well, is... Well, I, I do wonder who, who, who only works on convergence. Well, I, I mean, uh, that, that, James, that, that, that's, that's an awkward sentence because if you're, you're not only working on convergence, if you're interested in convergence, you're looking at evolution, you're looking at adaptation, you're looking at ecology, and these are things we're going we're gonna to talk about in the next, yeah. in the next few minutes. So... Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't think that's fair. But uh, but Amanda, back to your point about um, not specifically for people who work on convergence. Are, are are you thinking like for people who specifically work on these problems, it's not right. necessarily the focus. Right. Exactly. So, you know, people who are not necessarily looking at, um, you know, convergent lineages or or or. Uh, issues with functional morphology and convergence or things like that. Okay. So I, I'm just... Um, I guess non-specialist non may have been a better way to put it. Well, I, I mean, certainly there's, uh, there's a lot of specialist things that come into this book. Like, he, he makes a lot of specific points about certain groups. So are you referring to it that way or just like... Yeah, sort of. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry for that derailment. I just thought... No, it's, it's fine. I don't know where we were going with this anyway, so... <laughs> well, I don't know. It was just... It was... It's it's an interesting book to read because as I was reading it, I was constantly wondering who it was written for. And so that's, I guess, why I wanted to have that, that well, discussion. I think that a lot of authors, and this is me coming in from... Uh, a, a somewhat non... This is my non-scientist side speaking up. Um, 
a, a lot of people, when they write books, they don't think about the intended audience. They write for themselves, and those books often can either be the most interesting or the most frustrating. Right. I mean, isn't isn't that isn't that like the most damning condemnation we can make about this podcast? Yeah, pretty much. You, you um, get that if you actually like listening to this podcast, which, to be honest, I don't. <laughs> I get to every goddamn week because I'm it. <laughs> oh, you're just mad that I called you a fat butt on the last. Oh, week. I'm mad about lots of things, but that one was a great <laughs> one. Um, but but in 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 that regards, um, I'm I'm I wouldn't say that I give him a pass on it, but I understand. Because it's rampant, it, and it, it's not just this book. It's a lot no, of no, science books, yeah. no, and it's a lot of non-science books. Yeah, no, definitely, so. and that's fine. But the what, the what, the one thing I found hard with this book is that it's tonally inconsistent. Because he says outright at the start, it's like lists are boring, and I do not want this to be a list of convergences. And the next five chapters are lists of convergences. Well, that's a little bit misleading. If you if you read in through. He breaks up the list of convergencies with talking about bits and pieces other there. Uh, that wasn't even a sentence. I don't know what I just said. Not that, um, that, that's a, that, that, that I totally understood that sentence, but yeah, believe God, me, someone did, that, that kind of rambling was sort of how I felt reading some of those lists. <laughs> but I mean, I, again, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to come off as as mean here. It's and this is going to sound really weird, but one of the reasons why I've actually been really excited about this particular conversation is that I read this chapter. It was super painful for me to read. I wanted to. It was very sometimes very boring, and I don't necessarily mean like some of the ideas presented very interesting, but the way that it was presented kind of hurt at times. And I know you love this book, so I really want to hear. Why? Your interpretation of it. That's, that's more judgmental well, than what I meant. I mean, what I mean is that I'm just, I, I want to know your excitement about this. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just the fact that it, to me it doesn't really matter the layout because reading about how all of these different convergent bits and pieces come together is what's so fascinating. That's why I'm so interested in convergence because, you know, just, you know, and it's worth it for for you know the the parts where he actually comes in and talks about how you know you're talking about even going into modern developmental studies like he does with with eyes and stuff like that. So I mean, I don't know. I think I think it's I don't see it that way. I can but I can see how people could, but. I just I, I don't see it as just throwing stuff at you. I see it as a, as a an interesting list of not list but an interesting um, exploration. No, uh, an interesting sort of line of stories maybe. Well, because the it's very clear from the the preface, and I do have as I say annotated like page by page comments, and I would like to go through most of them at some point. Sure, um, sure. But it's very clear that he loves the topic and that he's very emotionally invested in the topic. And this might be me being a cynic, but that kind of on-your-sleeve glee for something kind of makes me feel a bit uh, about... Come on, James, that's just me. I mean, come, come on. on. No one can have any enthusiasm over what they do. Like, no, no, I'm sorry. No, so, so, so I'm supposed do. to not get really excited whenever I go over to China or Korea and find something really fucking awesome? Like, so, so the stuff that I saw over there when I was doing all the cool stuff with lasers, I'm supposed to just go, oh, yeah, that's, that's great. Look, I'm not asking, I'm not... Look, I'm not asking... Have you ever seen me get animated about anything I do? Every once in a while, yes. Hey. Very rarely. I but, had the show up in my browser, but it didn't start until I refreshed. Do you guys mind taking it from the top? Oh, God. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Hi, Dave. Good to see you. By the way, something I wanted to mention. We have a questions and answers section here, so if you have any comments that uh, you would like addressed, no, we're not starting it from the top. But, you know, you can watch this, and it will be archived on our YouTube channel. And uh, we'll also hopefully be able to rip the audio and put this up in a podcast feed, probably in the junk drawer. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so you can write in questions, and, and we can discuss those things, and we have a chat log that's coming up, so... 
Um, anyway, sorry, what were we talking about? That was just uh, too funny to... You were currently disagreeing with me for James. saying... Well, right, right, right. We were disagreeing with you about whether or not you can enjoy something. No, it's uh, not about whether or not you can enjoy something, okay? <laughs> and I understand, maybe this is a cultural thing, and I'm pretty sure lots of English people will tell me it's not, and just a stick in the mud. It's fine, but that combined with the way the uh, the way the book was written, it, it gets very carried away sometimes, and that is what was kind of rubbing me the wrong way a little bit. Yeah, but I think I, I I think in order to be able to write a book on any topic, you have to be extremely enthusiastic about it. You really don't. Either, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you don't want it to be boring. Hey, James, you could write James, technically I, a very good book that you don't really give a crap about. I I, I want to watch. I want to read your your lovely expose on grass seed. Just just <laughs> what, grass seed. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'll write out everything about grass seed, and I'll write an expose on it, and you'll love it. You'll It'll be eat so it engaging and interesting to read. It will because, be, because then your you can passion have some... just exudes from the page, or lack thereof, because it's then much more academic. I don't know. Look, okay, fine. You guys just completely disagree with me. But, Curtis, you work on brachiopods now. You can't mm-hmm. tell me that you actually really enjoy that. And... <laughs> Amanda teaches, which is also one of the worst jobs on the planet. So, hey. I, you know. <laughs> I have a lot of fun, even if I have been bending over inhaling dead cats for four stop, hours a day. Stop, for the day stop, stop. Okay. okay. Tons of fun. But no, okay. Anyway. So, okay, I'm saying, saying you sh- I'm not saying, <laughs> we're going too long on this. I'm not saying yes. <laughs> that you shouldn't enjoy what you're doing. I'm just saying the amount of kitsch, the amount of, like, the American twee that comes out in this book is a bit, just a bit much for me sometimes. But, but, but okay, so to, again, go back to the preface uh, that was talking about the Vienna series, and what they're specifically looking for are mostly theoretical papers because mm-hmm. they believe that biology has been hamstrung by a look for data, and they just want people to have out... No, just, just that no. most are... Most have been data oriented, and that we're not actually dealing with theoretical biology in the same way that we're dealing with theoretical physics. No, I completely like, agree. The way when you say is like the, the the need for data has really ruined biology. <laughs> it's, it's just a funny sentence by itself. I, no, I, 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 I know, I, but it, but it is kind of what the, what they're I talking about when they say the need for specific. Yeah, we've all lamented on the podcast that ideas papers can't get published anymore. Right. Yeah. Right, having, and that's having, essentially what this, yeah, this whole thoughts that other people for. can then use as springboards to test and like argue with or agree with. That was that's something good, and this book is good for it in that regard. Although I do wonder if a book is the best format and whether short papers might not be better. Well, but I mean, again, the problem they with get that published, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I was going to say. Special so, volumes, right. which no one reads, but you know. Um, I have papers in special volumes. Um. I've read them, I think, I think, maybe. I think um, we all have papers in special volumes, but... Oh, don't, don't uh, worry, nobody cares enough about... Yeah, regardless, words. go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think that this is, is definitely written up a, a, to be... A, you, you, you keep throwing out manifesto, and I don't actually think that's... Now <laughs> Well, okay, but you th- you threw it out there as a pejorative, and I don't actually think that's necessarily the case here. Like, I think what this group is specifically looking for is a theoretical manifesto, and as such, you're kind of gonna end up with something that feels like that. Like, they're they're looking for things that aren't that are are pushing a very specific theoretical agenda. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this this theoretical agenda in this book seems to be aliens. Uh... <laughs> Based off the, the, um, the, the those paragraphs, which Curtis loves but doesn't understand. I don't understand and they irritate me, but I also I also think they're fantastic, but they kind of derail the book for me. And I, Amanda, I think you you think they're quite quite interesting. I just, I just think it's kind of cool, but then again, uh, I like sci-fi fantasy stuff, so Why I like. Why isn't there a centaur, Amanda? Why uh, isn't there a centaur? See, I thought that was cool, and the fact that he ties it in with. Praying mantises are actually kind of neat. Which yes. are obviously half man, half horse. Well, again, we're coming in from a, a, a more postural, functional, yeah. well, structural thing. So um, going, going back to the preface, the preface. Yeah. Um, the preface is fine. Preface is how I say it. 
Um, the, one of the first things that they mention, and this is, there are a couple of basically, I think, fundamentally, I just disagree philosophically with some of the things they posit. And the first thing that really got me, aside from the fact that rewriting, hist rewriting historic quotes is really useful, <laughs> this is like my first note. <laughs> Where, where was where was this? You're rewriting historic quotes. When he oh. says that limited forms most beautiful is or limitless forms most beautiful is wrong, and it should be changed to limited. And I'm like, you can't change a quote. That's not how quotes work. <laughs> I don't think that was the intention of. Uh, never mind. He, he, no, no, he does that. He does that several times throughout the course of this. In fact, actually, looking at the last chapter, he rewrites Darwin. Um, but... well, we, we're not on the last chapter yet, Curtis. So hold that. Thought. I'm not. I'm not going to jump ahead. I'm just saying that that is actually a rhetorical device that is used repeatedly. Yeah, but no. The first thing that that, that I wondered about, based off uh, something they say. Is, is I do wonder whether convergence and constraint are really that intimately linked because constraint surely would also lead to just greater amounts of homology because things aren't going to change. Um, I, in, don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think I understand where you're coming from. Um, but it's one of those things where there are only so many ways to, to solve a problem. Um, and I had a really fucking good thought. Damn it, it's gone. Um, Curtis, you were going to say something. Pick it back up. I'll see if I can remember I, it. I was going to ask what he meant, so um, that was not helping at all. I oh, apologize sorry. for okay. just not being able to fill the negative space in this no, case. No, that's fine. Um, it's So, okay... I okay. I vaguely remember it had something to do with ecology and and, and environment. Um, something about how again there there. I just I all I can think of is there's so many ways to solve a problem. Your environment and ecology are going to put are going to provide parameters and yeah limitations yeah, yeah. limitations that you, that's a good word yeah. yeah um and you have to solve the problem within those limitations so yeah i think constraint is actually a, a a pretty important part of convergence okay no i agree with you on that but my take on this as well is that this is viewing convergence as being more of a rule perhaps than it necessarily is, because one of the things that we'll get into in, at the very end is his complete disregard of, of history being important. Um, and the other thing about that, my thought of constraint is that, as well as maybe, okay, so constraint can mean that mechanically there are only certain ways to tackle an issue, and so that you're going to converge on the same biomechanical kind of... Um, that's so like, the other point I was well, trying to make, a functional functional constraint, yeah. yes. But at the same time, constraint can mean that you are stuck in the ecology you're in and you'll never try something else because historically you have certain things and you're never going to move beyond that. And so constraint can cut both ways. Either like a stabilizing selection, like you have the possibility that you could change but there's never any selective force that would push you outside of that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, that that's certainly possible. Uh, one thing, I guess, that I, I think is interesting that is just my interpretation, but I don't think it's the author's interpretation, is he talks about, he divides up two types of constraints. He talks, he talks about um, the environmental ecological constraints. Basically, like, the environment says you uh, there's strong selective pressures against everything but a few things. And then the developmental constraint is, look, because of my own lineage and my own history, I can't actually do that. No matter how much you want this change to occur, I can't sprout wings out of my back because I just don't have the key ingredients for that to work anymore. Like, there's nothing there to modify. And so, um, you, you mentioned, James, about how, like, there does seem to be a trend throughout this book at least especially the first two chapters, it's hinted a little bit that history doesn't matter as much. And that's, I think, because he posits that there could be developmental constraints or environmental constraints, and he always favors the environmental constraints, unless that's, he can't. I, I was going to say, that's not necessarily true. He does talk about developmental constraints in several areas. But only in regards to what doesn't exist. 
it's you know that 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 does get us to our centaur argument or angels as another good example yes. like, like dragons. They, they did yeah. find angels in the fossil record because uh, Terry Go did reference to called Seraphim by Scottish Scottish quarrymen. So that's nice. it's adorable. Nice. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I do think that there's. We'll, we'll, we'll get to some of the stuff in, in specifics, but but I do think that there are two forces at play. There is both evolution, like history, and there's also like ecology and adaptation. Yeah. And those two things, like obviously adaptation, results in evolution. But what I'm referring to when I say evolution is more of like the the hierarchy in your synapomorphy and the in your history to get to that point, as opposed to adaptation, when you're moving into a new area and you can develop a character due to selection for a very specific ecological role. Like whether or not your characteristics are due to convergence, due to an adaptation, or whether or not they're due to your history. Um, and and, and I, I think there's a duality there, and I think the trend of this book feels like he doesn't think there is. Well, given given the remit of the series, whether or not he thinks there is, he's only exploring one of them, which is but, fine. Given uh, that's fair. Like, the yeah, idea given of the book. given given the idea behind the book, I don't think that's as much an issue as it could be. He comes off very strong in discounting it, so discounting the other side of things sometimes. Um, um, yeah. Well, and, and, uh, so, and so that that kind of gets me. I think. Can we talk about the first chapter? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because we're we going to skip over the eye thing that irritated both of us immediately. The, the... That's just it's just petty petty crap. Like that don't. Is, it is petty uh, crap. But it just is it just is an example of why and actually that why it is not as bad as it. This is an example of I think the inconsistent tone of the book. The reason Curtis and I initially thought this book was a bit. Uh, it's because he said about he in the in he explains about how he first thought that convergence was fascinating. It's because he saw the eyes in the snake and the eyes in the cat, and they look the same. It's like how come they're the same? And Curtis and I both went, well, it's because they're homologous. They're the same. Their eyes from a from a te- yeah. from a tetrapod. So what, yeah, yeah. What he means is, is, that is the both slits. Have slits. Exactly. Yeah. That mm-hmm. is conversion. And but, it's a very important convergence. Yeah, but it, again, it, it, writing it that it, way, we were both like, yeah, right. But, but this is the preface, guys. I know. I know. It's the introduction to the book, but the trouble is, it's it's like this is where it's a also, very also he's talking about person. when he's like eight, so. But he's not eight when he's writing it. No, but come on, that's a look. Uh, look, look, I've Stop used that to... advice of when I'm eight. I like this. I like, know. Okay, look, here's the thing, right? Amanda's trying to defend something that I've said is fine. <laughs> because it's explained later on in the book, and the only the only wish is if it's said. Hey guys, I'm just I'm just getting warmed up, so just, that's just good. Stretching, good. stretching, stretching well, so, the defensive muscles. And so what what I'm saying is that I think sometimes this book could elicit um, a, a, a sort of a reaction. Response. Yeah, a reaction based on the order things are put and the way they're phrased and explained. Not actually the way they're intended. I can I can understand that. Um, that. That was the only reason I wanted to 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 mention it very briefly is a bit of history as to why Curtis and I have been joking for about three weeks about the horror of having to read this book. <laughs> you guys, it could be worse. There are way worse books. It could be. I could have told you to read a book about the Ark. Let's let's not even touch that with a ten foot pole. Oh, so a barge pole or an arc pole? No, no, no. <laughs> For one. So um, so within the first chapter, he basically defines convergent evolution. Yes. Right. And and, and we should probably just do that for the hell of it. Yes. Yeah, probably. Um. So my first note is about being irritated about how he defines a porpoise. So I don't think I'm going to be much <laughs> use. So, basically, one of the things that I actually really like about this part of the book is that he's got a series of phylogenies, Mm -hmm. and he says, like, look, if this characteristic evolves here, and it evolves once within this group, and then it's in all of these things, that's not a convergence, that's a synapomorphy. Yes. And he does it, use the term secondary homology, which I don't believe I've ever encountered before, but that might just be because I've never encountered it before, not because it's something that doesn't exist. So, is he referring to secondary homology, like, like a reversal? No, secondary I, homology no. is what we call the homology. Right, yeah. That was, yeah. 
Yeah. I think for him a primary homology is like literally being the same thing on the same animal, but nobody's used it that way forever. Yeah. Well, well. So then he says, like, you know, if you got the structure evolving independently in lineages, then it's evolving convergently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that, if we're following Patterson's uh, sort of test of homology, there are two types of convergence. There is true convergence, which uh, Patterson would define as, in a broad sense, they look the same, but when you look at the details, they ain't. Yeah which is basically your bat and your bird wing. Like, yep. you can look yeah. at them, oh, they're wings, they fly. But you look at them like, no, they're modifying different bones. There's no way you would possibly confuse them as being homologous. And that is what I would call convergence. Yes. That's, that's true convergence. Your opposite is parallelism, which to Patterson's mind, now granted, Patterson was, at the time when he wrote this, a pattern cladist who was talking about a, a lot of interesting things. pattern cladist things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, like, so he wasn't even thinking about phylogenetics in an evolutionary context, which is bizarre. But we've yeah. more or less moved beyond that. But regardless, yeah. he he thought of 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 parallelism as being a special case of basically cryptic convergence. That if we look at them, we can't tell the difference. But if we do a phylogenetic analysis, they obviously cannot be related. They've either got to be evolving because of similar selective pressures on the same uh, developmental strategy, or they've got to be like a re-expression that's occurring multiple times. Yeah, they're, they're what in modern terms tend to be called developmental homologs. Yeah. Or basically... Uh, again, that's, that's a little too simple because parallelism can also just be because you are modifying the same structure multiple times, which wouldn't be a developmental homolog necessarily. No. But they're basically non non historical homologs as opposed to being things that just look for do the same function. Yeah, and and the thing I think that kind of immediately made me go a little eh, I'm not quite sure if I want to follow that is that um, the author of this pay uh, author of this book basically tries to say that not only is parallelism a special case of convergence, but we might as well just call all cases of parallelism like standard convergence yeah. and ignore that there's any difference. Well, the reason he does that is because when people first... Uh, oh, God, God, Jesus Christ, Dave. God damn it, Dave Marshall. True convergence, paleocast and paleo after dark, they look the same, but don't be fooled. Yeah, we swear a lot more. <laughs> yeah, how the fuck do we look the same, Dave? Seriously, yeah, what the fuck hey. are you doing? Hey, we got a woman, so... They, they, have, they, have, they have one, too, now. Oh, they do? Oh, well, we, well hey, we had one first, guys! Why let's, do I let's... feel like like we're the second Jurassic Park arguing about who had the T-Rex first? Let's, up, James. Seriously, uh, let's, let's, let's not throw down on this one. This, this no. seems awkward and yeah. scary. This is, and, um, and I feel Dave bad about this whole conversation. Do, we're not going to win. Um, um, also true. Um, that, no. that, is, that is the one thing that sort of throws me off. Um, you know why he does it? Oh, totally I know why he does it. That because, way everything can be convergence. Yeah, and not just that, but people have used it to argue that convergence doesn't exist, it's just parallelism, and so yeah. he has fought against it. And this is the part where I, like, feel awkward because I agree with him and disagree with him at the same time. Oh, we have two. Thanks for listening. Good job, Dave. Sorry, I just, I, I just, I just threw that one out. I had to correct Amanda, so I just, I just threw that out there. I apologize. Deeply Whatever, apologize. Dave. Thanks for um, listening, by the way, Dave, as well, because you're going to go. So, so, um, um, so, so yeah, this is where I feel conflicted because, like, I agree with him. It totally is convergence, but it it's is. also it is, it homology. Is a, it's both. Yeah. It's complicated. Here's the thing. This is, and this is my, my big problem with it. Parallelism, theoretically, is more likely to occur than true convergence. And so by just lumping it in, you can say that convergence is way more widespread and important than perhaps it truly is, because you're adding in a ton of things that are closely related. When you look at his lists, a lot of these things occur in the same family, even though they're convergent. So they're probably parallelisms. But and it's, so still, it's still at some level convergence. No, and I, I agree, but, but that might be developmental. I, I understand that it's a yeah. different process. The process is everything in biology. Well, that is true, but at the same time, this is a book that is trying to sort of go, 
look at this, look at what we can do with this, look at what we could do with this, and this is important. Is the what we could do with this centaurs? Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, I, th I think I think you're right. I actually do. Like, like I know you're making a joke. You're making a glib no, joke. It, it's like it focuses on what isn't there an awful lot, and I think. No, no, no. But the, the, look, look. The first class for phylogenetics that Ed Wiley taught. Well, I mean, the, the first class for his phylogenetics class. He always said, "Look." He drew a graph, one line going up to infinity, and another going to an asymptote. And he said, the line going to infinity is possible morphospace. We can imagine an infinite number of things that could exist. And then the asymptotic line is the number of things that actually can exist. And I do think there are hard both developmental and uh, environmental limitations. And it's a combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, no, the, the functional part, the environmental, the ecology stuff. I, I, I agree completely. And I, 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 and a lot of other people agree completely, which is why it's baffling that I have yet to see a citation to Silacker or Raup. I am kind of surprised he doesn't cite Silacker in here. Yeah, I am I'm, kind of surprised for that. Yeah, especially considering um, some of the, the the talk about parallelism. I mean, it does seem. I, I don't know. Silacker is one of those authors that is sometimes he goes into into extremes in some of his ideas, and so therefore, like the kernel of the idea doesn't get cited. I think yeah, that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this, this, I think at times this book veers towards doing a similar sort of thing. But that's the point of the book series. Like, I don't I know. fault yeah. the book for that. No. <laughs> no. Well, no. Look, I know, and uh, I like, think, no, no. I think the main. The, the main reason that even though I'm a little bit shaky on the way he addresses parallelism, I can understand why he is doing this the way he's doing it. I think there is a more honest way to say it, though, which is we can't tell the two apart when we look at the fossil record. Which is also true. That's potentially fair. I, I do, I don't know, I, I understand you have to build an argument and you have to obviously support the argument that you're building, but this linchpin right here really did feel like it was a way of destroying something that could be used against him in a way that he can address it once and then never address it again yeah. and expand the number of things he can cite by about 100%. Yeah, that's it. It, it. it felt to me as a way to sort of like conflate things to massively inflate the number of examples he can give. And the, the tackling it this early on is a way to sweep it aside and say, that he, like, th this is a fact, that this is how it is, and that people are going to just accept that because he states it authoritatively, and then you can just go on from there. But, but again, mm -hmm. where I'm conflicted on this is that he's technically right. Even if it is a genetic re-expression appearing over and over again with the exact same developmental homologs, turning that gene on is still a convergence. No, he, no most of this book, this book is almost entirely at least as far as I've read so far, accurate. I think the difference is whether I assign any special meaning to it all. Mm. I, I think that's that's potentially the case. Like I, I certainly feel as I'm reading this that um, it, it's very much a case where I think we're both coming to the same basic understanding of the data with very different conclusions. Like, like the, the, the overall the, the overall idea of where this is going and, and what it actually means. Um, but yeah, anyway, so he, he talks about, he defines parallelism versus conversion evolution, basically calls them equivocal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we talk about evolutionary constraints and uh, ver versus environmental constraints, which I guess we already kind of talked yeah, about a little we, bit. Yeah, we kind of already beat that dead horse. So. And he's really going to come back to that in Chapter 7, which I guess is going to be the last one of these things that we do when we do yeah. 7 and 8. So. Yeah. Um, and then he starts talking about mimicry. Well, well, the, the, this this is where I'm like, sorry that was my favorite podcast this, of ours. Okay, this this is just yeah. where I want to watch Amanda and James just talk this out. I want I want to see this right <laughs> so, now. I'm just gonna sit here smiling. So the mimicry thing is symptomatic of what he does throughout this, which is where he goes purely off functional convergence and not morphological converge convergence. And morphological convergence is what true convergence is. Functional convergence is a byproduct of things living on the same planet. 
And with mimicry... Well, that's a little bit of a freaking... <laughs> Here's the thing, right? His I, net no. of what he terms convergence is really broad. And Dep- considering the amount that he talks about porpoises, his tuna is really not dolphin-friendly because he just catches <laughs> everything and mulches it all up together and then just eats it. Just got um, um, Seriously. Um, <laughs> Well, uh... he basically says that if if you if you have spots or if you're brown or if you have anything that hides you, you are all convergent on the same thing, and it's like it's a tactic. No, it doesn't that, mean it's that is not that is that, no that is not what he is saying. No, well, okay. At one point, he does say running anything that runs fast is convergent on running fast. Well, yeah, that is true. Um, so I, I kind of actually agree was, with James on this one, but let, no, please explain your side. I, I want. I don't want to. I don't want to fight this. But talking about talking about like the examples he uses versus the 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 snakes. The with, the double the double penis snakes. No, dear penis. God, no. The <laughs> the I look poisonous, but I'm not snakes. Oh, okay. The coral snakes versus uh, yeah versus, versus the, the, the milk snakes and and yeah. uh, um. There's some water snakes. I sorry, think, sorry. Florida double penis snakes comes later. <laughs> Much later. Jesus Christ, Curtis. I was hoping we could not talk about that. Well, he spent um, an entire page describing penises, so I don't think. Shut it's up, a... James. Which, which is one of those situations where he like intimately describes it like you've never. It's like seen... a fleshy structure. In other words, a penis. <laughs> anyway, let's. Something that can go into another animal and then inject parts of the animal with the penis into the other animal. I'm, you, you see my front door right here? I can just leave at any time. You wouldn't leave your own home. You can feel free. It'd be hilarious. We just occasionally see a squirrel come in and then just <laughs> they like the cat. It flashes to your screen when the squirrel or the cat are fighting. Um, my point is, is that these are actual examples of convergence. And yeah... Granted, everything that runs is not convergent on running. That doesn't make any sense. But you well, can't yeah. you can't just dismiss this as living on the same planet. The thing that I'm sorry. Is when he says predator species repeatedly and independently evolve forms that deceive prey animals into not noticing them, so hiding is a convergent trait. <laughs> Well, well, again, but again, like this, this is this is a question. But he's of, right, but I don't think right. it's as important or as like some special meaning to it. That he I, 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 think, I think he needs to rephrase that slightly. Mm-hmm. But, but actually, I think that's what he's going for, and I actually think that again, theoretical biology, like yeah. he's defining convergence in such a way that any function that overlaps is convergence. Yeah. Like, like, like he goes very specific in a few cases in the next chapter, but he's very much thinking along the lines that if you have a similar function, you... And, and actually, I, I'm going to back up on James and say that I think Amanda is right. He's a little more specific than just hiding is, is no, a function. He's, 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 he's saying that you're converging... No, no, he's saying you're converging on the form of the thing that's dangerous. Yeah, no, no, but he is, he, is very, he has very specific things, and at the end there's a paragraph where he just blows it out to everything. Well, but, but again, this is a theoretical biology book, James. Like, what do you expect? He's going to say, here's the specific examples of obvious convergences that we can look at of this thing looks like a milk snake. Sorry, this thing looks like a coral snake. Why the fuck would you look like a milk snake? <laughs> this thing looks like a coral snake, but it's a milk snake. Well, what if you're um, convergent on the thing that mimics the thing? Regardless. That is a thing. That is also, yeah, the yeah, like that's, monarch, that's a, viceroy, and viceroy, yeah, such. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, um, yeah, he might blow it out in the last paragraph, mm-hmm. but blowing it out in the last paragraph, isn't that kind of the point? It's not, like, I know, it's just, it's really funny, because if you, if you think of this as like a painting, he's, he's done this beautiful Monet, and then you get to the bridge, and suddenly it's Picasso. <laughs> If it's if it's Monet, shouldn't it just be much larger spots that you just need to back up way further so away from Jackson to see Paul. that it's a bridge? And then you yeah. find out that it was a bridge that was hiding and it's convergent on the Jaguar that you didn't even see in the tree. Oh my god, it's a Jaguar bridge? Oh my god. Oh god, the car or the cat. Um Then he talks about the organization of the book. Which, which... I don't think we need to talk about. Yeah. No, I think yeah. we should talk about because how the fuck is this book organized? Well, it's not intended to be an encyclopedia of convergent evolution, but I'm gonna damn well try. 
Well, well no, I, I think you need you you need that sentence there because he's basically saying this is everything I could find, yeah. and and this yeah. is very much like building up data as a manifesto. Well, the thing he does is he states outright it's like where his phylogenetic classifications come from. I have Just never that... read Le Cointo and Le Guiada. I don't know who they are or what this phylogenetic classification is. At times, I don't think it's very good, but they might be vertebrate guys. I don't know. But... Well, considering he had to supplement, and then ex and then this is that doesn't include extinct forms at all. So they've had to take Benton, Donahue, and Nicholas for the extinct forms. Why the fuck I... are you just throwing shade at random phylogeneticists? What the fuck I'm not is throwing that? shade at random phylogeneticists? I mean, this you know, that's that... the second time today I've heard that phrase. Just throwing I shade. Not, I have not heard that phrase since like the nineties. Okay. Curtis okay. was from the nineties, so we all are from the nineties, James. Um, Up from the 90s in Europe, which made it a bit better than the 90s in America. I say he's from British 90s, which is a little bit more electronica and a little less grunge. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> that's true. So, yeah, that wasn't as painful as I thought it would be. I'm not <laughs> no, yet halfway through this beer, so we're chapter, gonna... chapter one. That's chapter, chapter one. one. We are chapter edging one. towards two hours, like I said. So can I just say the thing that really, the, 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 the thing that bugged me, and this is just a terminology thing, and again, being p petty. Okay. <laughs> At least he admits it. At least he admits it. When, I approve. When he said that the porpoise has lost its tail and grown fins, and lost its legs and mm. grown fins, and I'm like, no! Fins are uh, yeah, yeah, that's not a little bit hyperbolic. And that yeah. was a bit, eh. No, no, I, I agree with you at that point. I yeah. kind of recoiled yeah. and dropped the book. It's kind of trying to uh, push aside any potential ancestor. Homology! It's yeah. <laughs> they're modified. And also, okay, he talks a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about how if you look at the dolphin fins, they're exactly the same as the fish fins. Have you ever looked at a fish fin? <laughs> they look nothing they're radically like different. Yeah. Fins. And this is why I'm superficially they look similar. This is going to very broad net, and yeah, and this I think why, maybe this is part of the problem because he says if you were to look at a porpoise, you'd think it was a fish, but well, it's not. It's, and I'm like, whalers and, in the 1800s thought it was a fish because they couldn't even read. And then he said you'd think it swims like a shark, but the tail goes up and down, not like a way. Different, and that's not because that even functionally is very different. Yeah, but ichthyosaurs swam like sharks, so there is that. There we go. I'll give you that. Yeah. I will. I will fight. I will fight for you on that one. But, but, he, the, but he compares ichthyosaurs to dolphins, so. <laughs> well, that yeah, but. Yeah. So no, there's just a few little details, and this is something we get into the second chapter, and it was something that comes up again and again. There are a few times where he makes decisions or makes calls that are probably incorrect or is not cut and dry. But this is what you this is what happens when you do a massive synthesis of things, and you have to pull in things you're not familiar with. So you yeah. can't hold that against people too much. But it's just yeah. sometimes they're a little linguistic, and I don't think it's necessarily intentional, but they're linguistic ticks or tricks that distance relationship and homology when it's there to focus on the convergence, which again I know is the point of the book. Yeah. And and I think yeah, I yeah. I mean I don't I don't particular I don't personally hold that against him. If you want to, that's cool. But um I I personally <laughs> don't. Um I there were a couple of things that sort of threw me off. Um and I actually have little markers, extremes. Um, Excellent. Are we on to chapter two now? Yeah, we're I would presume two. we are, yeah. Okay. Um, but I just I I think it's some of the stuff is really interesting, and he ties in things like you have got the earliest core dates, like the the conodonts, the really early conodonts have this, you know, fin sort of finless, um, well, dorsal and ventral fin morphology. They don't have limbs or anything even remotely resembling limbs, and you sort of see that this has popped up again here and there with eels. Um, it's plesiomorphic. It's plesiomorphic, yes, but it's still a loss of... This is my other big argument. I think that convergence through loss is much easier than convergence through modification to a it structure. Is. It is, <sighs> but it's still it's still a level of convergence. The moment, because... the moment a tetrapod loses its limb, it's snake-like. And that just, you know, by pure definition, is easier than... But uh, aren't we technically... 
Go ahead, I, so, sorry, are, are we still technically back at this kind of like parallelism argument? Like to lose something, you have to modify the Hox genes probably in a very specific way multiple times. But at the same time, it still does count as a convergence every time that it happens, James. But, yes. Yes, but it's it's. it's Reversal. The, the ease doesn't uh, matter. The ease does, does not matter. It does. In terms of like pure bulk, what happens? There is something more fascinating about something that, from scratch, has independently evolved the same structures to tackle something. I'm not. I'm not something. arguing that. But the point is, is that it is still a level of convergence and therefore belongs in the book. You I know you're arguing the same point. It's fascinating. Like, you're both saying that this is a really great, interesting example of convergence, except James is like, but he's downplaying it as being... Like, you were arguing the same point. Yeah. Repeatedly, over and over again. Like, yes, no, it's it's very interesting, but it's fascinating. Why, James, why do you feel the need to downplay the fact that this is easier? Like, like I, I understand, like, I guess from... An, Maybe our biggest issue here is, James, you and I are both coming from a phylogeneticist perspective where we're interested in how things are related to each other and not necessarily the function of those structures themselves. So the fact that certain things are easier to lose over and over again is the thing that's interesting to us because it's the historical transformation that's happening over and yeah. over again. And, and Whereas we... I'm... Go ahead. No, I was, was going to say, I'm, I'm a functional morphologist. That's what I do. And so the fact that it's lost it, it's got to be for a reason. What's no, that reason? No, it doesn't. Well, that's, that's true. That's but my big point. I are... don't see the overarching big plan to some of the, the things that he talks about. I just think it could be genuine noise. Now, again, that's from a phylogenetic perspective. But if there's, a lot, if there's an ease to something, you're more likely to either accidentally do it or just do it in response to something because... Switching off a gene, say, is. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just gonna pull back something that you've, you've repeatedly defined in, uh, James, you've repeatedly defined within the podcast. You, you, you've argued against adaptation and then said, what if it's just a passive selection towards a, pro towards a new optimum? Like that's adaptation. Like, like you, you, you're defining adaptation by arguing against it to some degree. No, well. No, no, don't, don't get me wrong. This, this book later on we'll get very much in the idea that there are there is progress towards evolution but we're not there yet so we can't have that argument I know but for what, what but I think I'm communicating badly what I'm sort of saying is is yes adaptation happens definitely but at the same time sometimes things happen just because there is no selection against it yes that is true hard to tell. Modern studies suggest that if there is, like, it, it, it's, it's a lot harder to get just through random drift actual meaningful change. It either tends to be stochastic and doesn't do anything or yeah, just I mean, goes it away. Have, it doesn't like, have to be meaningful change, but there can be change. That's true. Like, I guess the, the loss of our, mo of, a, of our wisdom teeth is a good example yeah. of a non-meaningful reduction of a character. Like, it's but, just because there's no well, selective pressure to keep them there. Yeah, I guess the, the conservation of energy, which is what basically, adaptively speaking, no selection will, will invariably be, is itself kind of adaptive to conserving energy. But I, to my mind, just my backwards way of thinking... That's just kind of something that you're automatically going to be doing, going to try to conserve energy any way you can. And I think the fascinating thing about this is I think this book is very much using conservation of energy and those kind of very hard constraints that don't even have to be like adaptationist, but just like the broader like physiological constraints as all being a reason for convergence. That mm -hmm. we all have to maximize the amount of energy that we have and there's only so many things that are plausible given what we have right now, both mm -hmm. because of developmental history and because of the rational like environment. Like certainly if we had infinite plasticity, we'd all probably be tanks, right? Because it's way more efficient than legs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The one thing that he made in the eel argument oh my good lord, excuse me, that made me sort of go meh was that he used mosasaurs. Yeah, you like, and I was kind of like, not so this much. Is broad, this is his broad net thing again. Yeah, and and when you brought that up, I was going, yeah, this is this yeah. is an example of that. But you know, dude probably doesn't work on mosasaurs. This I don't is, blame him. Yeah, mosasaurs this is pretty freaking cool. But I found I found my notes on the eels thing, 
Um, so I just wrote, first of all, in capitals, fins underlined are still appendages in capitals underlined. Because he says... Caudal, caudal and dorsal fins, though. I wouldn't yeah, the, consider the, those... the dorsal fin, fin, I think, is, yeah. the, is the key point that he's going to. And then I just... I mean, wrote, sorry, go on. No, that was... I was just going to say, caudal and dorsal fins are not appendages, James. Yeah. So, and that's uh, what he's referring to in, like, conodonts and shit like that, because they did not have paired, uh, paired fin appendages things. Uh, Meh. So, uh, I, will, I, will, I will cut you on this, man. I will cut you if you say that conodonts had real fins. You have a long way to drive in order to cut him, but I would love to see it. I will cut him we'll keep through the stream the up. Look, look, whatever viewers are watching right now, we'll keep the stream up until James is cut. I swear to you. That's my promise. Where so, where is my knife? <laughs> just, I've got one here. You can just show up. Um, <laughs> so no, my right. Literally, the, what I wrote here is 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 just exactly what I was talking about. I just wrote: Could the eel-like body form, which he admits is plesiomorphic, simply be a case of repeated reversal? Could this be considered simpler or more easily attained than convergence on an apomorphic condition? What would this mean in terms of treating convergence as a uniform process? And that, I think, is what gets me. He treats it, he says, at the start, he's going to treat it as a uniform process, and I just don't believe it is. I think there are different things feeding into it, and that itself is interesting. Yeah. And I just think uh, that this goes on to something else I, I wrote about the structure of the chapter, but I sort of say, um, or I wrote... Uh, uh, I, he... I find it... it I, I wonder if in invoking convergence for entire organisms, which he consistently does occasionally, it misses the truly interesting aspects of the phenomenon uh, that convergence acts on traits, and so some aspects of an organism will be convergent on another, while the organism as a whole is following its own wholly unique trajectory. Um, and so yeah. I just think sometimes it misses some of the interesting aspects of convergence and treating it as a gestalt whole. You mean like questions of mosaic evolution? That yeah. Certain things are yeah. more like... Certain things are more likely to change or behave in or, or change in different ways that yeah. aren't necessarily predictable. That, it's not like it's a perfect like, yeah. like progression I mean, of that, every aspect of the animal. That is interesting, but I don't know if that's quite the focus of the book. Exactly. I think this is where focus comes in. What I'm interested in is probably going to be too complicated for what, as a book, it sets out to do, which is to get people interested in and in understanding of like the fact that convergence is a thing. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. That, I think that's true. Um, also, though, like along that, I made that joke about like what is the organization of this book. Um, but what I meant by that is that it's not organized based upon evolution. It's organized based upon functional form. Yes. Yeah. I say I, I say I, it makes sense to some degree. It adds structure to what would otherwise just be a long list. But it results into uh, the way he breaks it up grates a little bit as well in this chapter where he does it by predator and prey and then lists the same friggin' things in both sections. Yeah, I, yeah, I was He gonna... only does that a couple of times, though. Stings, uh... beaks, eyes. Yeah, and again, he considers uh, the nematocysts, like the, the, the little stinging cells in jellyfish to be the... on a bee ass. Yeah. On a bee. Yeah. Like that. That, that actually was the biggest stretch for me in the entire thing. Fun like mechanically and functionally, they are massively disparate things. I wouldn't argue... But because he's saying functionally that they're just to inject something into something else, which I guess then should we get to the... We add the penis back in? <laughs> yeah, I was going to make that joke, but yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm they go in, he goes into this cool wing thing, which everyone does as convergence. The wing thing is yeah. a, it's a good a one. It's a classic. It is. Well, it's, it it is. is. He starts throw out in the first chapter. It's, maybe it's, it's, maybe it's a parallelism, and I'm like, why would you say that? <laughs> yeah, I know, because it's not. Um, but it's it's the dark side of the moon of convergence. You know, it's it's been topping the charts for how many decades? I was say, so you, you play it over the Wizard of Oz and it eerily syncs up? Like, what? <laughs> My dad, no shit, um, like, in the mid-2000s bought a DVD where somebody had done that. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah. I think he still has it. I've, My dad's I've, I've watched YouTube videos that did that before they got taken down. Occasionally convincing, but no. not really. No. So, what he, what he does do in the wing thing is again, this is where inconsistency comes in. He does say it's, I don't think he says it's miraculous. No, you might say it's miraculous. No, I don't think but, he does. But uh, the, it's extremely unlikely that uh, 
Winx was involved, and yet it's happened three times in the evolution of vertebrates, and I'm thinking, we've got millions of years. Given that this is a threshold process, either it works or it doesn't when you have a change, it's not that unlikely. You just need to keep rolling the dice, and when the six finally comes up, it sticks. And then he does that exact same thing later on for something else. If they're threshold points, it's a left wall argument. And also, yeah. then when he talks about why, like when he talks about eyes being too small, that again is a left wall issue of, of reducible complexity issues. I mean, but we think... are... no, go, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, seriously, Amanda, go ahead. I, I don't have anything interesting to add to this. Just the, the argument that I was going to make is look at any number of other characteristics. Look at look at. Um, Fuck, I don't know. Look at ruminants. Look at gut fermentation. That's shown up a hell of a lot more times than flight. It has. Look at... I don't know. Um, look at look at patagial gliding. Even that's shown up more times than powered flight. Yeah, he mentions, like, what, 60-some-odd times that gliding effectively has arisen? yeah. yeah. So he's not wrong. Powered flight is hard. It's hard to evolve. It's hard to do. It's energetically incredibly expensive. Um, there are examples, and we just saw that with the ET thing in China, where you can sort of try to do shit with it, and you'll fail hard and bomb actually, out. That actually disproves one of his examples of things that never happened, which is a leathery winged... Yeah, yeah, it does. But, um, but to be fair, to be fair... This, that just came this, out. Yeah, that's that not just fair. came out. That's not fair. We can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. But that's but, the difficulty with arguing with negative evidence, because there's never been a mammal like snake. Why? And I'm like, how the fuck do we know? We don't have a perfect fossil record. But that's the thing with the, with the, the but that's the theoretical side of this book. Yeah, um, no, I agree. Uh, but, but my point is, my point is, powered flight is a bitch. And as somebody who studies things that do powered flight, especially things that do badly powered flight, in early on in their evolution, yeah. it's a pain in the ass. It's hard to do. He's not wrong. He is not wrong that powered flight is hard to come up with. He's no, right. I, I, th that's fine. I just think it's that uh, sort of sort of peg the fact that it's happened three times as being particularly odd when you'd expect it to be super super hard. Just given the amount of amount of fossil record um, but the, the, and that itself okay that would be one thing but then when he does say later on that something else it's like you'd think it would be really weird it might even be eyes really weird that you get eyes evolved but given that we've had 500 million years of evolution is it really unusual and I'm like how can you argue for one thing with, with wings and the other with this other thing that was something he pointed out that I wanted to talk to you guys about but I don't remember what page it was um, that was prey detection, I think, or no, that might be predator detection. No, when no, you start talking no, about I don't eyes. think it was. Um, um, but oh, yeah, the, he... leg, the leg thing. What did you guys think about the leg thing? That well, that is something I want to talk about, perhaps later. Um, or I oh, know we can talk about it now because I because yeah. I just I just wrote it's, down. It's really the next thing. And by the way, I have... river, river otters are mammal eels. By the way. Um, <gasps> yes. I was like, and I wrote down, I, if I, I look like at this with a convergent eye, river otters fit the bill exactly. Yes. <laughs> and then That's I said, as for why not, contingency. That's why you don't get things. <laughs> it's just contingency. contingency. Yeah, well, he's going to, again, we're going to get yeah. to the point where he vehemently disagrees with that interpretation. Yeah. So yeah. the legs thing, the reason I disagree with him a little bit on the legs thing, it's I, I on the one hand, I agree that functionally you create the stilt-like thing to propel yourself. But arthropod legs, every single arthropod leg evolved to the marine realm. Tetrapod legs evolved to the terrestrial realm. So no, so not necessarily. The earliest tetrapods were actually marine, or not marine, but aquatic. I'm, I'm going with Amanda on this one because technically our, our lobe-finned fishes are kind of probably... He doesn't count the, no, their fins, he doesn't count them. We're going by the goddamn book now. So <laughs> yeah, that, doesn't, is, that is true. Well, okay, <laughs> then he's wrong, evolutionarily speaking, Then because those are our earliest tetrapod limbs, or your lobe-finned yeah. fishes. But what it means is that well, arthropods uh, have convergently now, adapted legs for walking on land. Arthropods have co-opted existing limbs for walking on land. Now, they would have modified Curtis, them somewhat. 
Uh, Curtis, so did we. you're actually kind of wrong. Um, the earliest the earliest tetrapods were still aquatic. Ichthyostega, still aquatic. Yeah. Acanthostega, still aquatic. They had webbed fingers. They had legs. They lived in water. Yeah. But they were yeah. true legs. So if he's arguing that the earliest tetrapod legs were for moving on land, then he's wrong. He's incorrect. And again, no. I think that just might be the, the broad net that, thing. I think that's um, just James. No, he argues oh. for locomotion, but he does sort of. Talk no, no, about... it's not that it's not locomotion. It's that they're still just in water. They're kind of like it's kind of like the hippopotamus motion, the walking motion. But but isn't that more of a semi-aquatic lifestyle as opposed to a strictly aquatic lifestyle? Like the no, whole well, loaf and things... fish thing. Like they have to go out of their dried puddle in order to go to the next area. It's well, why they actually were moving out on land is kind of a, a, an argument that's still going on. Was it to get from one place to the other? Was it to avoid predation? What was it? Was it to find food? What was it? We don't know yet. Um, but I'm just using like, yeah. living modern ancestor, li living modern equivalents. We've got right. our lobe fin fishes, which do have some part of their lifestyle which has to have them on land because their yes. their ponds dry up. So right, right, and 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 no, I I agree with you there. There is some level of semi semi aquatic lifestyle to these guys, but but what I'm what I'm saying is that primarily these things were living in water. So for for for. To, to sort of argue that, that, you know, arthropod limbs evolved for in water, well, technically so did tetrapod. Yeah, but I'm just using but the I, argument of the book, uh, using the argument of the book, like, it, it's having having big bony limbs, isn't that a less efficient way of swimming around than Oh, yeah, having... well, yeah. But you also so, so have to remember, why would well, it exist other than the fact that it had to support your body weight? It, yeah, that that's what these limbs were for. Most of the bulk of the locomotion came from actually the big the the caudal and the caudal fins. So yeah. um, they I, had I, the side to side swimming motion. So I'm not. I guess I guess I'm just being a dick now. Sorry. No, I, you're not I'm really still, being a dick. I think you're 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 pushing an interesting argument. I'm just trying to. I I'm still almost don't quite going. buy arthropod legs and tetrapod limbs being convergent. I'm really sorry that there is there. You could you no, could you could glue straws onto a worm and it would be convergent with either I, of those things. I understand that it's a that it's a stretch and it's probably again the sort of theoretical aspect of this of this book. Spe but Sp speaking of straws on worms, straws on worms, guys. Oh my God! Yes, the new hallucinogenia thing. Yeah, watch watch that video. Look that up. Whoever whoever watches this for whatever reason, look that look up that video. Real oh yeah. It, Stop watching this. Like th this is terrible. Stop watching this. Just, just, just watch that video. Then yeah, go home. It's, it's fine. Yeah, you can you can find the video on pretty much any um, news article on the hallucinogenia stuff. So, so um, the, the one question I had regarding the legs paragraph thing, mm -hmm. which I just don't. To me, this just feels like he's just plain wrong. This isn't about convergence, but this just feels like a fact that isn't a fact. Tell me, do you think this is right? Tetrapod species of vertebrates are much more diverse than non-tetrapod. Um, I think if you're using diversity in terms of disparity, which that's he may be doing, that's, that's not, not the diverse. same thing. No, I the know it's not the same thing, count. but but God damn it, we've had this conversation that people fuck it up. No, no, I agree. I agree. In which case, and, this and is so, wrong. Yes, and I'm, I'm but I mean, because so I'm pretty sure there's more fish. Uh, just, just, no, just there's let, not. Let her talk. Let her talk. No, there's actually not because there are there are normal? about tw 10, 10,000 species of birds. Yeah. Bir birds don't count because birds are Fuck weird. you, they count. No, uh, birds, 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 birds exist are... on singing to each other before they mate, and because of that, they're weird. Fuck you, James. Um, so no, I think I think beetles he might don't count right. for arthropods, James. How That's do we know they don't count? That's fine because then spiders still win. Um, I think, gosh damn it. I think I think he's right. I think but he's how right. How do we know we've found all the fish? <laughs> God damn it, James! That that's a fucking negative evidence argument. You slam the guy for saying, "Look, look, we know we don't have these things," and then we find them later. Like, no. What, what do I say? I never said I wasn't a hypocrite. <laughs> Where are my cats? I don't know. They've ran less away. Less diverse than the fish, no, maybe. maybe. They're less diverse um, than the yeah. fish. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, no, I think he's right. I think he's right in that regards. 
Um, and if we have any fish biologists listening, which I say something for Christ's sake. Um, but, uh, That's weirdly demanding, but okay. I, I'm just saying. Um, if we have fish biologists, for God's sake, chime in and correct me, because as we have found, I'm wrong about everything. Um, <laughs> so, but I think, I think he's right. Actinopter origins outweigh all other groups of vertebrates. Thanks, Dave. Do you mean outweigh as in they literally weigh more? Or... <laughs> There's a, uh, there's... No, he's wrong, because the largest fish is the whale shark, and that's a fucking... What about um... the sick fish? Well, okay, now you're just... Now, now you're, you're interpreting his as being weight, and that, never mind. Let's just... Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for still listening. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you for still being here. Uh, then he, does uh, say, he does say, in terms of wings, back, on, back onto wings, because yes. he, he says insect wings conversion, and he does switch... Okay, functionally, sure. Um, uh, <laughs> says they evolved from the gill branches. <coughs> I might be wrong, but I think that's actually still very much up in the air. I don't think we're quite yeah, sure of the homology of insect wings. Because I remember that evolution of the arthropod, arthropods, yeah, arthropods class that we took. Yeah. Um, and we had, like, a good conversation on evolution of wings, and it sort of boiled down to... Uh, yeah, and I think there have been some suggestions that maybe they're just invaginations of the body wall. Um, yeah. But anyway, and then he said if tetrapods had gills, they might have become wings, but because tetrapods don't have gills, I'm like, what about amphibians? Why don't we have flying salamanders? I, 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 just, I just want that now. Oh I my you. god, yes. I want that. Yep. And then you can think about it, it'd be great, because when they beat their wings, they would be breathing. I want, I want a flying butterfly van, uh, like butterfly salamander. They have salamander. to be in water, James. No, they wouldn't. Gills, it? gills are for water, James. That's a functional difference. We're not talking about. We're talking about convergence. Damn it. <laughs> well, well, so about that. Um, that oh this maybe. Oh my god! I have to draw that now. Th th this is maybe jumping the gun, but do we want to talk about lungs or do we want to keep going with what we have? There are a couple of other things, like, and this is where, like, again, basically, this is something he doesn't like. But it's true. You can get the same structures for very different functional reasons. Yes. And so he talks yeah. about long fins in flying fish. Long fins are in any pelagic fish. It's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, there, there certainly... Um, the, the, there does seem to be like a lot of descriptions of certain characteristics that do come up repeatedly. And, and I think the broader philosophical question that we can have here after I outlay this is, is is something that we've we've talked about with the podcast a lot about how generally speaking there's never a perfect like single answer to why a structure evolves yeah like is it because of your evolutionary ancestry or is it because of a consistent occupation of a similar ecology they both have signal and they overprint each other repeatedly yeah and so one of the good things he talks about is echolocation which i thought mm -hmm. was really cool and a general trend is that echolocation tends to evolve in groups that are predators yeah except for one instance where it doesn't yeah, yes. and it's those one instances that seem to ever so slightly irritate him and he tries to explain them away, but it's just one of those things, it's like the exception that proves the rule sort of thing. It's, well, because yeah. it does it does feel like he's trying to formulate an argument that evolution is predictable yeah. and consistent. Basically, if you just put this thing into the right environment, it will change in an expected and predictable way. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not necessarily saying that it wouldn't, but I'm saying that its history is also important as to whether or not it could change in the first well, place. I mean, to, to my mind, potentially, the reason why fructivorous swiftlets evolve echolocation when they live in caves is that they don't run into cave walls when they're yeah. flying around in the caves. Yeah, it's for navigation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, one thing, I just, I just want to state for the record that I fucking love his question on why are there no herbivorous bipedal horses or buffaloes because I would fucking love to see that shit. That would also be terrifying and also just watch BoJack Horseman. <laughs> I was, yeah, gonna, I was actually going to bring up BoJack Horseman. Yeah. Yeah. That's just BoJack um, Horseman. Yeah. That, that, that's um, fine. Like, that's solved. I just, we solved that. That's, I mean, that's, um, I just, that's one thing that I really like about this book is that it sort of makes you... <laughs> Picture these bizarre monstrosities and nope. like 
this this is great. Everything you love about this book is everything James hates about this book, I and know. it's so beautiful. It's great. I'm just watching this. No, no, because I, I I kind of agree with you. I do. I do appreciate the way that he uses negative space as a rhetorical device. I think he does so in ways that I don't agree with, but I think the question is still fascinating. I think so I'm not saying level. it's alien. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> I'm not saying it's alien. But it's alien. <laughs> of course, of course. But no, I mean, I think on some level this sort of talks to the little kid that I was when I was, when I was a little kid. And it was like, you you want to make up all this weird shit that doesn't actually exist, but it's sitting back and it's kind of going, why doesn't it exist? Why can't it exist? I mean, no, no, no. I, aliens. Look, 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 James, I agree with you. What he's describing is the fact that convergence is also contingent. Like the fact yeah. that we don't have centaurs is because the evolutionary history of horses went in a different pathway that precludes that from being an option. Plus, as he does point out, it's really hard as a tetrapod to develop a sixth pair of legs. Yeah, yeah, um, but that, that's what I'm talking about. That's a developmental constraint. And yeah. from, my perspective, devel from my perspective, developmental constraints are highly historical. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he views it that way at all. Yeah, no. Um... Yeah, because there's that. Yeah, and that's why it's tied into ascribing an adaptive significance to every convergence, which admittedly there probably is, but the same adaptive yeah, sure. significance blanket to every time this convergence happens. Because then, because this comes up in bipedalism as well, and I'm sort of like, why? He's trying to work out why humans are bipedal and why theropods are bipedal, and I'm like, why does that have to be the same reason? I um, don't. I mean, and, I mean, and it isn't. It isn't. It has. It actually is not. Yeah. Um, I think theropod. I think not. Not necessarily theropod, but actually, as he mentions, it's actually probably a synapomorphy for dinosauria is by yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it has to do with um, increasing your um, running speed, whereas for us, it was a combination of factors for both sight and locomotion. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, um, and it it was not running. Oh my God, we are shit runners. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, our knees are terrible. Enjoy that as you grow older, kids. Um, yeah. Um, Dave, who has had knee surgery already at least twice. Oh God, second. I'm really sorry uh, to hear that, Dave. I hear I haven't. I've been fortunate enough not to have knee surgery, but I've fucked up my knees spectacularly. You didn't. So, you didn't yeah. skateboard though. So, so, so this is so like the, the exact thing that you liked. Okay, the bipedalism thing. This is the note I wrote. Okay, this admittedly is unfair, but this is me sitting uh, at Nika's <laughs> with iced coffee, and okay, so. <laughs> Literally, the, the two notes back-to-back -back are the why no bipedal X or Y is just stupid. First, <laughs> centre <laughs> first, center of gravity, and second, maybe just because there is no need, can we really separate develop... Then, genuine note here, can we really separate developmental and functional constraint when something is uniformly not happening? And then That's a good question. I don't think we can. But again, theoretical book. He's not yeah, trying. Yeah, no, to. I know. But that, but but it's making me think about these things. Which is the point of the book? Which, yes, exactly. So the book is succeeding in its goal. I know. But then this is my next comment. These mythological thought experiments exhibit no obvious merit to me. Fuck you! <laughs> you just proved yourself wrong. You just proved yourself wrong. Wow. Oh my god! Wow. That, that that really terrified Drace. I'm yeah, I'm I mean sorry. it it terrified me. So uh, it's understandable. That was just through the internet. I can't imagine being there in first person. Like, so, you're such a dick, James. No, well, look, I mean we're talking about it. And I'm not trying to hide the fact that I have an interesting thought on the back of some snark and then laid it up with some more snark based on the fact that I was just ignoring the fact I had a thought. It's, um, a <laughs> it's, it's a compliment sandwich, but he got it inverted, so the compliment yeah, is on the inside. Go. That's there actually a compliment sandwich. Because <laughs> oh, the bread right. isn't part... Of the, you don't say oh, I'm yeah, having a right. bread sandwich, do you? You're right. Yeah, um, That's so true. The other, two, two other things. One, one was uh, the ants. What is like, I don't know why ants would need to glide when they can fly. Only the males and the breeding females can fly. Most ants can't fly. So that, I, thought yeah, it was only, I thought it was only breeding females. I didn't know males could fly. Ma males can fly. Yeah, it, it's oh, okay. it's actually like usually they'll fly off to another colony, then they get taken in, yeah. their wings get bitten off by the by the workers, and then they get sent in, and the queen decides whether or not she's going to mate with them. Okay. Uh, 
And then the no, other... yeah, that 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 triggered my bullshit alarm. The, the gliding frogs. That's an awesome idea. He talks about the webbing between the toes and the gliding frogs as being convergent, but that's actually just inherited from the fact that all frogs swim with webbed feet. But, but it's a talking, modification. Yeah, he's talking about the expansion of the webbing and but the, sure and the elongation. modification. What the fuck is the word I'm thinking of? The elongation of the toes. The yeah. phalanges or whatever they are. Now you have to remember that uh, tree frogs, which, um, if I recall correctly, all species of gliding frogs are dis either descended from or belong to those clays. So it's probably parallelism. Shut up. Um, they have reduced webbing and elongated phalanges anyway. Okay. So if you have the elongated phalanges and you're actually ex then you're expanding the webbing. Okay. To glide. I mean, the, and that's that's me talking out of my ass and just remembering a handful fair. of photographs that I've remembered. So that's really fair, but it would be nice to okay. So maybe not, maybe not saying it would be nice to have that explained, but why can't there be pictures in this book? Yeah, pictures would be cool. Pictures would actually really help sometimes in showing similarity or dissimilarity. Maybe he couldn't get permissions. I mean, admittedly, yeah, I mean, if you're going to... Hey, 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 James. Yeah? So what's the recent phylogeny you're going to write up, and can you put a picture of the organism in there? This is talking specifically about <laughs> the, the things... <laughs> That you see. I'm it's just saying the way, thing that you hate doing, so I'm just the, the, just throwing no, that out. I put pictures in, but if I don't have any, I'm not going to put them in. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I'd also um, don't think that these look very. To be fair, uh, they're very functionally different, so I don't think wings are all either a very good example of convergence. No, it's a good example of convergence because they <laughs> are. What's wrong with you, man? If you can tell they're not the same thing, it's not very good convergence. No, that's convergence. We discussed this at the beginning of this whole conversation, that convergence is when you can obviously tell that it's coming after from different yeah, that, perspectives. Yeah, I, the thing is, the more I read this book, the more I'm like, he's just drawing everything in together too much, and I started wanting to split everything. Well, so... I, I, th I think that's... <laughs> What, Sorry, what, I just, what did he do? I turned what? the page. Of, I, turned the page. <laughs> I turned the page and saw this note. <laughs> I'm scared. I don't Me know about too. the rest of you. I'm really scared. Uh, uh, this note is theoretical morphology again. Full stop. Is it interesting? Question mark. Really? <laughs> Question mark. Okay. Yeah, it's a theoretical book. <laughs> No, no, no. I think he's getting at the fact that he cites his book several times, but doesn't explain what his book says. Oh, yeah, he does. Okay. He does do that. Um, I think. I think. I think in chapter seven he does an abridged version of theoretical morphology. But it, yeah. this book does assume that you've read his book, Theoretical Morphology, yeah. which yeah. we haven't. I okay. Now I'm on the page with the snake for mammals. With the yeah. <laughs> that uh, made me happy. No shit. Yeah. That made me happy. I was like, holy shit. Just ferrets, like, like full, full legless ferrets would be awesome. I wonder if the reason they can't do that is because of how either they breathe or how they eat. Whether putting pressure on the chest would just be too much. It's prob it is probably a diaphragmatic breathing problem. Um, it could also be the way our musculature is structured because lizards still have some of that sinusoidal movement, the way they move because they've got the uh -huh. sprawling posture, versus... Um, we have completely lost that. We've brought the legs under the body in a parasagittal yeah. motion um, and posture, and so we have developed our axial musculature to a degree that, or rather undeveloped, really, to, to, to sort of de-develop our mm -hmm. axial musculature to the point where it is paper-thin in some yeah. areas. Um, and, and, I mean, like in, in cats, some of their axial musculature is literally so thin that it will tear very, very easily, and you have to be really careful with them. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to do, I think, a lot with both the musculature, the locomotion aspect of it, and then also I think you're, I think you're right on with the breathing aspect because diaphragmatic breathing um, is much, much different in the way that um, squamates breathe. So uh -huh. I think, I think they are. But it would be, it would be really cool though, and I like yeah. ferrets. Why well, do you just why do you just want legless ferrets? That seems like animal abuse. 
No, I mean, I don't want to cut their legs off. I just you want you them to leave a leg, to be a leg natural spare, and legless. It would move by rolling on its side. It wouldn't go forwards. <laughs> No, no, what it would do is it would clamp onto its tail with its mouth and it would just roll like a ring. You just want Sonic the Hedgehog. That's what you want. You want something to roll into a ball. Okay. um, The mole form of digging isn't that simply just using the four limbs to dig. So it's the most simple, like any, 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 so anything that does this is convergent on a mole form of digging. But, but that's, again, I think you're, there, there are convergences of, of like modifying your limbs yeah. into sort of like a trowel-like structure. Like yeah. again, this, this is where, when you start talking about how you define convergence, a, a, a part of it does come from a human perspective of defining what is similar, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. Boxes within boxes, chairs and, tables and whatnot. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, like some of those similarities probably have some real ecological meaning. Like if you're needing to burrow, you probably need a structure in your forelimb that allows you to dig. Otherwise well, I mean, it's just not gonna see, happen. We see ow. Unless we you're see uh, I mean we see convergence on digging morphology across multiple groups, rodents and um talpids and um even even into insects. I mean, if you look at mole crickets, their digging morphology is really actually almost frighteningly similar to um, what you see in um, mammals. Yeah. No. I I was I was just um, making an argument that I think James's dismissal of that was maybe a bit unwarranted. Oh, I didn't even hear him dismiss it. So yeah, you're right. Be- because uh, again. That there are even if we can say that convergence is sometimes here defined very broadly, like at the same time it is filling the same ecological role. It it has certain constraints upon what does and doesn't work. Yeah. What he does do is um, when he's talking about digging, he says one thing that I think is possibly an in, in improper use of the term plesiomorphic when he talks about the hydrostatic system in earthworms. And yeah. and I just say that I just thought the hydrostatic system in the earthworms cannot be assumed to be plesiomorphic. It probably derived for earthworms out of like worms as a whole. And if it is developed convergent with lizards, then it's not homologous. And so one burrowing form is not plesiomorphic to another. There you can't the term doesn't work like that. Yeah. Just because it occurs in a more basal animal or it occurs earlier in history doesn't make it a plesiomorphic type of burrowing. Mm-hmm. So, so he was using it as a way to say primitive? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, primitive is sort of an out of vogue uh, term in biology and evolutionary evolution to begin with because, I mean, what is, an, is not primitive is sort of meaningless. It, it implies a certain progression that isn't there. Yeah. Um, it, it's just what is more ancestral. So I guess he could have just said earliest. That might have been better. Yeah, or just all. like on basal earthworms. I think it's just because the earthworm is a is a uh, is a much more lowly animal that it's assumed that what it does must be plesiomorphic. Well, anyway, um, I mean that's he gets into locomotion. He talks about the eyes a bit as well for like uh, location because we talked about echolocation a bit. One of the things that I thought um, he mentions the fact that eyes could either be um, a parallelism or a, or true convergence. Mm-hmm. And then he only cites the evidence for it being true convergence. Yeah, which I kind of thought was a uh... look. I understand you you've got a you you stack your deck, but that felt weird. Like he doesn't yeah. cite he cites the other people once and then cites five other papers that says yeah. true convergence. Now, granted, I'm not up with the research, so it's possible that general consensus could be that it's not a parallelism, but that did seem a little stacked in terms of of articles. Mm. But yeah, he talks a lot about um, the, the the pupil slit vertical versus horizontal. Why why that might be the case, which I thought was actually really interesting because I hadn't thought about that in years. And is it in, is, oh, is it weird that when you started talking about the horizontal slit in arthropods and sorry not arthropods and amphibians? I just kept picturing Kermit the Frog and I couldn't concentrate on anything else while reading that whole rest of that section. No, I think yeah. that's reasonable. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. good. Um, okay. One of the things uh, again, and then he goes into another one of those theoretical things that I like about infrared vision, and then all I could think about was Predator. Me too. Um, so yes. <laughs> I might have to watch that this weekend. I I realized that Dad had mailed me the DVD. Um, 
and so it's not packed. So I may have to watch Predator this weekend. Oh my god! Oh my god! He got to infrared vision. And I went. You mean like Predator? And then he's like, the limitations of infrared vision are you probably wouldn't be able to see much because you need to see what's right in front of you. It's like the fuck, like fucking Predator. You mean like the fucking Predator? I mean, to be fair, <laughs> the dude's mask not. And Arnie can't see. And he can't see shit. Like Arnie just kind of occasionally comes into view. Like anyway, to, to be fair, I mean, the dude can't. I don't think he can cite Predator in. <laughs> Even a theoretical biology paper, although I think he does. I think he does talk about, talk about the ecology of the xenomorph. I think he does. Um, I think he does actually mention that um, in order to see infrared vision, you would have to be alien. So, hey, predator. Is it? No, I, I, doesn't he suggest though? I thought this was actually really kind of cool. Like the the actual wavelength of the light probably dictates some limitations over the size of the eye that you would need yes. in order to be able to see different wavelengths. Yes. So in that, there, in that there sense, is a minimum, so, yeah, there's a minimum size to the vertebrate eye below which the, the, the eye simply can't function given the wavelengths of visible light, so between 400 and, 70, uh, 400 and 700 nanometers for humans. Isn't that um, a left ball issue? And the, the, I mean, not saying that doesn't detract at all from what it's saying. It actually corresponds to it. But once you have a function, there is something you can't go back beyond and retain that function. You either stop being, or you have to be at a minimum this. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, he's he's also referring to specifically the camera lens eye, not the compound eye that you get in, in uh, um, arthropods. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It applies to everything. I don't. I, uh, I, th I, th I think that does apply. I think that limitation does apply to everything. Um, granted, oh, yeah, you're, it, right. It, you're right. Gra Sorry. Granted, it might be uh, a, a question of luck of the draw of what was the f first few things to evolve that needed to sense anything. But at the same time, it also is possible that the easiest, simplest way, at least on Earth Atmo, for that to happen is uh, is to look at visible light strains and not anything else. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I just especially when he got to the infrared and talking about like limitations of 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 how close you would have to be to see an infrared, and I was like, oh, like the predator. Yeah. And then I th and then I started thinking, does the predator actually see an infrared, or does he just use technology to modify to the infrared no, spectrum? Really no, I think he actually sees an infrared, doesn't he? I don't know. They they start using UV light in the second movie. Yeah, but that was the second movie. Predator Two was shit. No, Predator Two was actually pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good. It keeps up the with the idea of the the culture of the predator. Uh, so really he hates talks about certain types of people. He, yeah, he, that's the awkward part of Predator yeah. too. Uh, so then he talks about um, like he a does say one weird system. thing. What is he, he, he? He does at one point kind of suggest that. Uh, uh, if you co-opt structures, so like if you have something and you occasionally do something else with it, that's not convergence. Yeah, that is kind of weird. <sighs> Again, I, th I think this is a need for convergent structures to follow a strict... Uh, no, I do uh, Yeah, well, like an, adapt an, ad an adaptation. Like it has to strictly be used for this thing. For because mm -hmm. I I think he's viewing convergence as a good sign of predictable responses to stimuli, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's necessarily the case for why convergence always appears. Yeah, yeah, he does. Um, he does spend multiple pages kind of building up a thesis for eyes and predation, and then at the very end of it admits that it's really not that simple. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and again, I, I don't want to... We're just reading the first two chapters, so I don't know where really this is all heading, so I don't want to put presumptions into here, but it just does It does feel like that there are there's a, a, a desire, especially when you're, when you're structuring your book, like, I'm just going to list a bunch of convergences. It seems like it's trying to wait how many times evolution is repeated on the same form, and every time it does that he can, he tries to give an adaptationist story for the specific selective pressure that resulted in this thing. Yeah. Um, and when he can't, he's like, it's still unknown as to whether or not this is the same thing. Yeah. Um, so the one thing with eyes that I thought was interesting, this is something he ever delves into, but he does say that uh, small cats have large eyes because they're going to be hunting at night. Yeah, they're crepuscular. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that that's a consistent adaptation that seems pretty... I mean, look, look at owls. Like, owls converge on really large eyes for huge a similar eyes. reason. Yeah, huge eyes. But at the same time, at least with house cats, which, is your, which are his example, there could be large eyes because we've made them pedomorphic and large eyes as a juvenile trait. Uh, except 
that if you leave a cat to its own devices, it will be crepuscular and or at least partially nocturnal. Yeah, uh, I think you're layering two things on top of no, each but other. It, no, like, exactly, but I think these two things are layered on top of each other. I think there is a degree of this is how you generate, maybe, and then this given, goes given, hand given hand. that Given what you see in, in Felis Silvestris, the actual wild cat from which we have developed um, house cats... It's I mean, still pedomorphic. I, I, I I don't know. I don't. I, I sadly I don't agree with that. I it, at least I at least I don't think that we have. You have to agree that pedomorphosis is how you generate the retention of large eyes in cats. Well, yes, but I'm disagreeing with your assessment of the fact that we bred them that way. No, I'm not necessarily saying we bred them that way. I'm saying with the small cats, maybe. Oh, saying, okay, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought I thought you were. I thought that was your argument. Was no, that with, with small cats, okay. like large eyes are probably a, a heterochronic trait. Now this correlates with. Yeah, but I mean, some of you don't know which cats came first, but it probably is hand in hand. Sorry. Mountain lions have huge eyes too Mount for their bodies. Mountain lions are pretty small, big cats. <laughs> yeah, but they're still big cats, so. It's one of those continuous ah. traits that. Let's re regardless, uh, James. I think you just kind of hit on one of your bugbears that you like, which is looking at heterochrony and changes in development time That's... as a way of looking at character changes. Yeah, but I do agree with Amanda how... yeah. that you're starting with a group that already had big eyes to begin with, and yeah. maybe you're making them what a I'm little bigger. What I'm saying is, convergence doesn't generate the morphologies. Convergence is why morphologies might be preferentially, preferentially selectable, or rather, no, convergence. Is the that's the that's adaptation again. Adaptation is not directional; it's directional at the time. Like you are passively selected for based yeah, upon you whether seem to or not. Consistently misunderstand my arguments about this and keep telling me something that I'm arguing for when I'm not. I'm not okay. saying it's not adaptational. I'm saying that the, the morphologies exist because of other processes, which are then acted on, which lead to convergence. And so we're only ever reading about half the picture in this book. Okay, so are you basically suggesting then a question of like primary forcing mechanism? I'm suggesting that what we're looking at here is a sort of weeding process. Like things don't evolve to like converge on being a flyer. There's the potential there and then because of interaction with the environment, the things that are better at being a flyer are weeded, you know, are not weeded out as much. And sometimes it almost seems like it, there seems to be at times a directionality to his thinking, which is what I'm saying, which I don't agree with. Okay, I'll I'll fall, I'll agree with you on that. I don't think that the pattern itself is directional with respect to like these things have to become birds. Like we know that the pattern of evolution is more complicated. You look at the horses again. Like I'll take that argument. Like give me nice carnivorous ones. No, let's not let's not make carnivorous horses jokes. But if we look at horses, there's a a, a a great amount of diversity of horses and a lot of experimentation. And the only things that survived are this one lineage that shows a progression towards grasslands. Mm -hmm. And that's a trend within that lineage, but it's not a trend that defines all of horses. And so it's more complicated than just the single progression towards this grassland like adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah. because of, because natural selection doesn't care about the future, it really doesn't. No. It doesn't work that way. Otherwise, it would be sentient and like a forcing mechanism beyond just a filter, which is what selection is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I do agree with you that at times there does seem to be a feeling that there is some pull towards a directionality. In this yeah, book. but I mean, the thing is that directionality, when you look at it backwards, is there, it, or appears to be there. This is what Gould said, but I get the impression here he doesn't like Gould's views on this. No, no, but that's just me having read the last chapter and sending you a bunch of Steam messages over yeah. and over again about how this is going to end. So, yeah. um, so I think we can stop talking about this. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. so, so, so the one red eyes are where he does talk about how. Uh, Eyes have been around for millions of years, and if it was possible, we would have had infrared eyes. But this is after he said it's miraculous flight evolved at all. Um, and then he goes off onto ones about alien life, and this is one of the. Uh, this is actually one of my bugbears. This is where 
I agree with him, but what he's saying is actually common sense. And it's basically saying that, like, if, if maybe, yeah, you need to be a, you, to look for red eyes, maybe you need to be looking on an alien planet. And then it's kind of like, well, of course, if we change the rules, different things are going to happen. This is this is common sense. I don't know. I think um, that's reasonable. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 mean, I don't. Very again, theoretical biology term. book. Yeah. I, I, I don't, that didn't, that doesn't bug me at all. I think that's no, perfectly no, no, reasonable no, 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 and logical. No, 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 you're not understanding why this bugs me. The reason, the reason it bugs me is because people looking for extraterrestrial life ignore this very simple fact. Oh. Okay. So this is where the book is really, like, he's really on the ball with it, and I hope it comes more into it later. Ah, uh, so you like point. the book in this regard? Yeah. Okay. You see, you always ascribe, you always assume things, and you start arguing against me when I'm not even arguing with you. Yeah. Um. So he talks. He's got a lot of examples in here, guys. I mean, he talks about lateral line system. Talks a ton of crap about osteostracons. Yeah, and then he talks about prey capture. Um, which, is, which is where we get to stingers and nematocysts. And, and osteostracons yeah. having an electric field system, and I'm not entirely sure that's as widely accepted as he suggests. Um. It there's, might be, but I don't know if it is. There's um, there's you know, there's people yeah. who agree and people who don't agree. It's science. Yeah. Um, that that is generally science, yes. Yeah. And he mentions terror birds, which are great. Yeah, he mentions oil birds, but oil birds sort of throw us throw a span into one of his, his carnivory adaptation convergences, and yeah, again, this, this follows up with the the, the same, like convergence having the same reason, which it yeah. necessarily doesn't. Talks about beaks. Talks about beaks a lot. Um, yeah. What does it mean by raptorial beak? Because tons of turtles eat vegetables and have a raptorial beak. Yeah, that was kind of. I was sitting there going, well, I mean, he talks about the alligator snapping turtle, which definitely, holy shit. Um, he and, talks and, about sickle claws and I, and how it's bizarre. Yeah, he talks about story, it. It's only have sickle claws on one toe, and I'm thinking, if that on every toe, they wouldn't be able to run. Yeah, well, he talks about. Um, retractile claws, and I was sitting there going, yeah, but cats have claw sheaths and dromaeus yeah, yeah, I didn't think that was... I, I think that that's, that's a good yeah. No, no, this is, this is real, this is true convergence. Patterson, yeah, once that is, again. Yeah, that is true. It, it like, is, it just is. because it's coming out from a very different structure, like, this is what we're talking about when we say true yeah. convergence. Yeah, it is, it is convergence. Um, he talks about gastric stuff um, like uh, gizzard stones and things like that, gastric mills. I don't I necessarily cool. think I agree that swallowing stones and having gastric teeth is convergence. <laughs> I think one is chorus, one is um, compensating for the lack of the other. Well, I mean, so much of that is happening within archosaurs. Yeah. Like, so yeah. much of that is happening within yeah. archosaurs, like... How much of that is a consistent re-expression of the same characteristic? Which again yeah. is convergence, but it's parallelism, which is maybe a bit more complicated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, par I mean, the question is what, what, whether you think it's interesting or not, and that comes down to the individual. Well, but oh, and look, he uh, talks. I forgot he talks about pseudotribus tibetic teeth too, which we just does talked about at length about yeah. teeth, which again is is very good. I don't know quite. Occlusion is one of those things that I think you could almost randomly hit upon just by varying minutely. So I don't, again, I don't quite know if I ascribe the same level of. I don't know. The, the ability to close your mouth is an interesting convergence to look at. But occlusion it's not even just it's not just closing your mouth. It's how you close your mouth. Mm. Okay. Yes, he, yeah. he does all fangs of the same sort of thing, which, again, is not quite... The again, ability to inject something into something else. Well, it's, doesn't he compare fangs to stingers to nematocysts? Like, that's rattle, the big thing. Yeah, rattlesnake yeah. fangs, spider fangs, the scorpion sting, the centipede fangs, when the centipedes are just coated, they don't inject. Um, so, again... Oh, yeah, somebody very, found a 13-inch giant centipede in their house not too far from here. They brought Fine. it in and gave it to our um, terrestrial uh, terrestrial ecologist. He got really excited. But 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 again, we're we're all still getting back to like I, I know this whole book is basically just a list. Like until we get to the last two chapters, yeah. I apologize to everyone listening. Like there's a lot of just there's lists there's lists and there's lists and there's lists. Um, yeah, I mean, and I don't I don't want to go through each and every aspect, okay. but I I, I do want to say that if you know if you're interested in looking at the diversity of convergence, it's it's a good list. 
Yeah, and and I think that's that's one of the major reasons for presenting it in the list is being like, hey, look, here is just a dump of if you want to look at every single example of convergence that I can think of, here's like a registry that you can go to and compare to, and yeah. start using this as a springboard to look for the future, which is one of the things as a theoretical book it should be doing, and it's good that it does it. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we're keep skirting around and most of our kind of nitpicking is all around this general theme that we started with at the beginning and we keep coming back to. Convergence is about similarity. Similarity is potentially a real concept, but it's also highly biased by our own human perceptions. Like what we view to look similar and not look similar is in some way an aspect of our own perceptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sorry, go, go ahead, on. James. No, no, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say another interesting little point I noticed when looking at uh, when he talked about the beaks, and then he talked about beaks in uh, Ceratopsians. Mm -hmm. uh, keep keep the trend going for things that you haven't seen yet, people at home. Um, and, uh, Good spoilers, James. And um, yeah, and then he sort of says that Cetacosaurs or uh, Cetacosaurus specifically, probably crunch nuts, and so its beak is very parrot-like, and the, the, uh, therefore, like, this is convergent. But then, interestingly, the descendants of Cetacosaurus are grazers, and they retain the beak. Mm -hmm. And that is but, just a fascinating little thing that shows how convergence and history interplay, and then you get things carried across yeah. that are convergent, but then maybe don't do quite the same function anymore, or are not used for that thing anymore. And it's, a, it's an interesting, complex system where these things interact on some aspects and then either cause it to go down a different way and then stop having that influence, but it's still retained. That it's, you know, that sort of thing. No, I agree. Yeah. We, can, we can go back to a paper that Amanda hated reading, but enjoyed at least the idea of with Gould and Lewinton, the idea that a, a character can evolve for one specific reason, but be used later on for something else. Mm -hmm. uh, that paper hurt to read. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I might have one more Gould that we might need to dive into, but I think it's far less Gouldian. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know where else you guys want to go with this discussion because we don't want to go through every single... No, but... I think we can maybe end with the parody because it certainly is one of the cruxes of a yeah. lot of well, people's... Did you want yeah. us to cover yeah. lungs? Because we haven't covered lungs yet. Because I've got a few things on... Oh, like, yeah, we can, we can cover lungs. Like where right. he said that hearing evolved so you could hear insects. I'm like, that's a tall order, but it's... It's unprovable, but it's, you know, you can't say one or the other. But the lungs thing... was weird to me, because... I think he defines away the problem by having a surprisingly strict definition of what a lung is compared to how he defines most other structures. Well, it, yeah, it was weird to me, because if we're talking... It, he seems to be naming convergence as similarity of function. So mm -hmm. the book lungs of an insect would seem to be a good example of convergence but in that case. But he says case. they're not. Mm -hmm. He says they're not at all. He does not consider them convergent evolution. Yeah. He calls them divergent evolution and then never explains why. Yeah. Yeah. And it does the same thing with endothermic, actually. And granted, from what I looked at, from, I have a book on divergent evolution, and I don't think it falls under that category. I could, I, I don't. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd have I'd, to double check. Yeah, I, I don't know. As I said, I'm just using the the rubric, the 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 Rubicon. Mm -hmm. That's not really <laughs> using the structure. The rubric is what I was looking for. The rubric that he outlines uh, for convergence in the book. Yeah. It would seem like that's a functional similarity, a structure that's serving the exact same function but comes from a different pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that I thought was a little bit, a little bit weird. Yeah. Um, and then like the the uh, dinosaurs and ornithodirons both having the same respiratory system, while well, seeing as they form a clade, maybe that's actually homology. Um, but then discounting the arthropod respiratory system, which I thought was fascinating, given that he said arthropod legs are essentially. Uh, yeah. convergent with the tetrapod legs. Um, yeah. I think the similarities in function uh, of the, the book lungs and actual lungs are probably closer than they are between the legs and the legs. Yeah, uh, probably. But that was just an interesting little quirk. And this, I think, is, again, where one of the tricky, as Curtis has said, one of the tricky bits about convergence is that we are defining unnatural groups, so it is very much how we perceive things. Yes. And so, and that's just one of those quotes where he perceives things a certain way, differently to how we all actually probably perceive it. 
And so some of the issues that that Curtis and I had in the book are just because we perceive things differently to how you and he perceive perceive things. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so the yeah. viviparity, I guess, is what's left with, which is a yeah. favorite. I've told this story before, but I had about a twenty-minute conversation with someone, Corey Morris in Cambridge, about viviparity because it's one of his favorite favorite things, and it's something we've talked about on the podcast in regard mm -hmm. to marine reptiles and yeah. well, marine things in general. There was a definite yeah. trend. Well, and viviparity. yeah, and he talks about that how it evolved in placoderms yeah. way well, before we ever. That's an interesting quirk because it might suggest that for tetrapods, or at least deep down, it might be plesiomorphic, and so potentially it's a parallelism again. But then again, if they're the same thing, it doesn't. But but again, he work. he spent the time in the beginning to define all parallelism as being convergent, which mm -hmm. he is right. It's still a convergence. And to be honest, if you're going to go for something that's viviparity, is in some ways. A particularly interesting thing because it's a rather discrete part of animals. Like it's something that there is not going to be a standard like everyday pressure for it. Mm -hmm. But then when you breed, there could be very definite advantages or disadvantages. So it's an interesting sort of other to the standard convergence discussions, which is why I think it gets focused on a lot in a lot of yeah. talks about convergence. Yeah, I, I, and it is a, it is a good example. Oh, no, I was just going to say I kind of appreciate that we're now two hours in and the audience with the video can now see the trajectory of Amanda usually falling asleep at the two-hour mark. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm very glad that you managed to get it going for this because I know you had a really long day. Shut up, Curtis. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, parody, i.e. live birth, um, it's interesting. He One of the things that he goes into a great detail actually talking about um, the sort of like scale of motherhood yeah. investment. Yeah. So, with one being minimal, and then five, or is it four, six. It was four, very arbitrary. Five, very six. arbitrary and continuous it's, scale. It's, yeah, it's four. Um, so, with one being lycotrophic um, viviparity, which just means um, hardly any in like. Um, you have eggs inside of you, inside. but you're not actually connected. They're just eggs yeah. that are inside of you. I'm pretty sure yeah. humans can encompass all of this scale. No, no because they're the placenta um, and a bunch of other things. Yeah, yeah. gas. So people put a lot less four. effort into their children than others. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now you're, you're making jokes. Four. Um, the uh, obligate um, placental bearing mammals, essentially, is what we are. Uh, and, he, do, um, he does suggest that it is kind of a grade, but then he defines these four sets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and what was really interesting to me was that I was not aware that there are skinks that are obligate placentals. I, I learned something from that. That was, that was really cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. And that is that is literal convergence right there. I mean, you can't get better convergence than that. Well, it's just where the, 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 the yolk becomes a placenta, right, and stays attached to the body wall. I mean, I don't know what's specifically back, happening with those skinks. You sort of vampire, you should direct out the mother. It's re, go go and look it up in a fucking intro bio book, guys. I can't explain it today, but it's it's it has to do with the membranes of what was the amniotic egg. We modify some of the the membranes for implantation on the body wall. So things like the allantois or Alan Toys, depending on whether or not you have any French background, which I actually don't. I just think it sounds better. Um, and modification of yolk, modification of membranes, like linkages of blood vessels, you end up with shunts to bypass pulmonary circulation. Um, it's If you are a placental, then you have a shit ton of modifications at both your embryonic stage and as a female. So Yeah, I mean, position of organs and everything like that has to be substantially modified for that case as well. Yes. Not only that, blood flow has to be heavily modified, hormonal levels have... I mean, your, your fucking um, hypothalamus and your, your pituitary gland have to be highly modified because of the way that you're putting out hormones. So... Ob Obligate placentals? Yeah, I thought I heard a siren. 
Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you um, had a failure to recall. No. Okay, I'm not the only one here or anything. because the cats are freaking out. Whatever. Um, I'm, just, I'm wondering if this is a, a kind of horror movie and you're about to be attacked by a giant obligate percental. Okay. No, I um, think someone's playing music somewhere. Whatever. Um, so, I think I, I think I hear it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, guys. Um, I think I hear it because there are cars driving. So. Obligate placentals require a very... It's both an energy time sink and a very high modification of... Um, of uh, um, morphology and development, so it is not a light endeavor. No, no, fair enough. Like, there's a lot of things going on, mm. so that means yeah. you've got yeah. a lot of changes that have to evolve convergently, and it's really cool to see that in skinks. I, yeah, I agree. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think we're probably winding down. We'll probably have a few more things to talk about. But if anyone has any questions, I know there's a delay for what we receive, for what we're saying, and what everyone else receives. So yeah. Yeah. So to put them in the Q and A. Yeah. Type some questions if anybody's here. And yeah. In the does, meantime. Yeah. Yeah. As, as far as like the vivid parody argument, I mean, I think it's it's just it's a classic uh, convergence argument. So it, it it's a good. It's a good ending argument to make for the the animal chapter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we're moving on to plants, and it's kind of. I'm not gonna. No, I don't know. If I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah. Plants. I I'd imagine plants show way more convergence than animals do. Yeah. So. yeah the, the chapter is, I think, quite a bit longer, actually. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I, I mean, I'm just gonna like really apologize to to anyone who works on plants because we're probably really gonna mess this up again, like okay, we always so do. But yeah, 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 we get to we get to yeah. tackle plants again and invariably mess yeah. it up, just like well, always. The one thing I noticed in regard, just back to the penises for a minute. Um, <laughs> He he ignores all the arthropod penises. Like he only talks about fleshy penises. Arthropods have lots of penises. He doesn't mention them at all. So again, he's giving arthropods like the short shake. Well, it could also be that he's a vertebrate person and or an, a non-arthropod invertebrate person and just doesn't work on arthropod. So why would he know about arthropod penises? You do research for a book, you know. You don't just. I, James, the last thing I want to do with my life is go to Google Scholar and type in arthropod penis. You know, you know, that, well, you know, you know, you know, Crystal, and she works on beetles, and that means 90% of her time looking at beetle wang. I, I mean, the lot of spider taxonomy is based upon looking at the pedipalps, which mm -hmm. is but basically those the genitals of spiders. With penises. <laughs> they are pedipalps different. Pedipalps are not literal penises, guys. Penis that doesn't he? Doesn't he give one example of like a, a female extension that's effectively like a, he calls it is a pseudo penis? When, is that when they inject the seahorse? Oh yeah, well that's because they pleasure themselves and other females with it and stuff like that. But that's a dominance thing. That, uh, maybe. Um, maybe. I'm no, he, he's not. That. He does not talk about hyenas. He doesn't talk about that. But he talks about something that's the opposite. Does he talk about male? the male carrying and seahorses at all, because that's fascinating. I, th I don't think he does, which makes me kind of sad, because that is really fascinating. It's really cool, but, I mean, that doesn't necessarily fit with convergence. That's more yeah, an odd apomorphy. It's, yeah, unless, it's it's a, unless it's a sex converging on a different sex. But that's that's not that's not the same thing. Yeah. Again, well, that, that's not the characteristic. Oh, no, he does. He says, most curious, the female dwarf seahorse hippocampus... Uh, Zoestre, a peculiar bony fish, uses a gon uh, gonopod-like organ to transfer eggs from her body into the body of the yeah. male seahorse, where they are fertilized. Nice. So that, that, that's, in that's which, the example. In what could be argued to be the convergent evolution of a pseudopenis by a female animal. That's that's what I was talking about. That's, that's the one. Pretty, pretty interesting. Do you know yes. my, my hairdresser... Um, I've Please don't about tell this. me that your hairdresser has a pseudopenis, James. <laughs> no, no. She thought seahorses were mythical. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be in this conversation anymore. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, why did you do that? Um, uh, yeah, no. So overall, in the book so far, like aside from a couple of times where he's cast a really broad net and killed a few dolphins, um, <laughs> you can't argue when he says convergence happens. No, like no I think a, it, uh, and, and a yeah. lot of the time he's right. It's just I think the spin you put on it is mm -hmm. where where like the difference is coming. Yeah, 
James has a hairdresser is the question from Dave Marshall. I just saw that. Yes, I do, because my hair is longer than about, well, I mean, it's, it's, it was cut uh, last week, and it's this long, so I don't get, get a man to cut it. It would be terrible. James James just wants to look pretty. Mm -hmm. I have a guy cut my hair, and he does look a really at, good look job. Look how good it is. Look at, how, look at the wave to it. See? <laughs> See how pretty I am? So does James anybody else have any questions? James has repeatedly mentioned that he looks like a lion, but I don't think anyone else has any questions. So um, I don't know. The interesting thing that he does mention is, like, despite the fact that animals don't have, to, uh, despite the fact that plants don't have to hunt, they also go through convergence, which I thought was maybe in. Well, he does say, say he does say something interesting about how, like, he he mentions it with birds, like predators drive like ma major morphological changes. Mm -hmm. And that then, like things stay like pred, and then that that you want to stay a predator, but consistently in archosaurs, um, predators return to being herbivores. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it, there. does seem to be a, a, a again a look at like predator prey interactions and that that kind of old. Old, old, old school like escalation arguments kind of being pulled into here without without actually explicitly talking about it. Because I don't think he he doesn't cite Verme or anything like that. But th then again, the, but then again, this is a list of convergences, so it's it's yeah. not quite the same thing. Like it, But notice he doesn't talk about perhaps. I, and this is where I'm going to be wrong, and you're going to slap me down, Curtis. But by valve and brachiopod shells. Ah. Uh, I mean, they're both bivalved uh, filter-feeding organisms. If you want to talk about them from a strictly functional perspective, I mean, granted, it but gets more complicated because, like, clams. The, the, yeah, but I mean, then the the clams are like you know burrowing, and and most brachiopods are kind of like accreting to the surface. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the shells themselves aren't homologous, right? Or am mm. I wrong? I don't think I don't, they are. I don't think so because you've got you've got uh, evolving within mollusks and evolving um, yeah, yeah within leviforids. So why wouldn't he yeah. mention that? Because that's fantastic. I'm, I mean, the, he says that it's not an exhaustive list, and there it's is true. a preference oh, no, towards vertebrates, and there is a preference towards predator-prey interactions, which is yes. intriguing. Mm -hmm. And that, I suspect, is possibly where his it's gonna, it's gonna bear fruit. When, I think it's going to bear fruit a lot, and I'm going to be inter fascinated to see where he goes with it when he talks about convergence of ecosystems. Yeah, which yeah. Uh, so I guess next time, which we're going to be meeting on the 19th of July. Yeah. And uh, since that's a Sunday, we'll be doing it a little bit earlier, so three central. Um, we'll put again a another note up on Twitter and things like yeah, that, and another central, reminder. Four, four East Coast which puts it at 9 in the UK. Okay, that was part of uh, James's desire to make sure that uh, poor Dave doesn't have to stay up as late as he's staying up right now. So Probably thank you, Dave. Yeah, next time, sorry, but... sorry, Dave. Thank you. Thank you for coming and asking questions, Dave. I've been tweeting occasionally, so it's really listening hard. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, i I, I got to be honest. Would you want to listen to us anyway? No. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to be reading chapters 3 and 4 of this book, which are going to be looking at convergence within plants and convergence within ecosystems. And uh, so I guess um, if we don't have anything else, we'll see you then. Nobody? Anybody? No, nope, I got nothing. <laughs> I think we're good. Yeah. Right. I think we're done. Cool. <laughs> well, uh, have a good night, guys. <laughs> yep.